Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land I was speaking to you from, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. In six weeks, six issues, we're exploring the big themes we're facing as COVID-19 changes the world around us. And we're bringing you the top policy experts and decision makers who are directly involved in planning Victoria's recovery recovery to answer the questions that matter to you. And today we're looking at the future of Melbourne and the shape of the recovery plan for our capital. We'll aim to get through as many of your questions as we can. And some of you have already sent in the questions online, but you can also submit questions during the event through Slido and you can vote for the questions you like, which helps me with moderation. And our guest today is CEO of City of Melbourne, Justin Hanney. Justin was pre previously head of the Employment, Investment and Trade Group within the Department of Economic D Development, Jobs, Transport and Resources, with oversight of Visit Victoria, Development Victoria, Trade and Investment Victoria and Small Business Victoria. And prior to that, Justin was CEO at the City of Yarra and the City of Wangaratta, and he also led Regional Development Victoria and was Deputy Secretary at the Department of Premier and Cabinet. A warm welcome to you, Justin. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Kate. Good to be here. Well, look, the images that we're seeing of, you know, an empty CBD would have been absolutely unimaginable eight months ago. Describe the impact of COVID-19 on the city of Melbourne. Well, Kate, it was really like putting a handbrake on a, on a car. It just stopped uh, overnight. So we went from having a million people in the city every day of the week um, and even busier on, on weekends with, with visitors and people uh, coming from interstate and from, from out in metropolitan areas to attend restaurants and theatres and, and cultural and sporting activities and to go from that. Uh, and stage three was an impact, but stage four has really uh, turned the city off nearly in, entirely. Uh, so just devastating impacts right across the board on, on businesses, um, on, on, on institutions like the State Library. Yeah. G give us a sense of, you know, it's an extraordinary time we're living in, but give us a sense of what happens behind the scenes in a crisis like this. You know, particularly in those early days, what, what did the City of Melbourne do and how did you develop the support packages for both residents and, and businesses? So the, look, the first thing we did, Kate, was we went, we've got to make sure that our workforce is safe um, and that uh, that if they weren't in a in a safe space uh, and a fit space to be able to deliver the services on an ongoing basis, so we have some two thousand employees, and a lot of those a lot of those employees are delivering essential services. We've got nurses, we've got uh, staff that work in childcare centres, we've got contractors that now need to make sure that waste is picked up. We've got people like health uh, health officers and on street compliance officers and building uh, services officers. So things still happen to buildings and still happen to restaurants and the like all the way through. So we needed to make sure that we had our workforce safe. So really strong measures in place to, to ensure that, you know, the critical frontline teams were, were divided into smaller groups so that if there was contamination, there was a, an infection, there wouldn't be cross-contamination, et cetera. So that was one. And the second one we did was gather as much data and information as we could. So speaking to community leaders, speaking to business leaders, um, and really listening in terms of what were the immediate uh, immediate concerns. And they ranged from uh, car parking issues through to, um, you know, through to uh, people feeling potentially unsafe on the streets of Melbourne as they emptied out. Um, so look, a good example, Kate, we made the decision that, you know, we would stop early on, we'd stop um, fining cars, that we'd, but we'd make sure cars didn't park in disabled car parking bays or what we call red zones. But we made sure that our on-street compliance staff, we doubled down the amount of staff so that they had a more of a physical presence um, walking around the streets so that people in the city of Melbourne, uh, Melbourne, city of Melbourne felt safe. Um, we grabbed as much information from businesses as we could early. Uh, we established what we called a business concierge service and we made the decision early that every single business in the city of Melbourne uh, would be contacted multiple times. Um, one, to check in on them, how, how are they? And two, 
were they aware? Um, a lot of times, small businesses especially just don't know how to access information. So to make sure they knew where to go to access information on JobKeeper or where to go to access information on state government grants or supports. Uh, and we came, and as a result of those conversations, we came out with some early um, early support uh, support packages. And, and, and have you seen the impact of that early support? What, what have you learnt from that? We have. Uh, look, we, we put out some multiple grants. So one of them we knew, the comedy festival you might recall was just about to, to take off and we knew that well, there was a whole lot of artists that are a critical part of, the, of the, the, the City of Melbourne community that were going to be without work and so we provided um, significant grants uh, to artists. Um, and we provided those uh, in a very, very short period of time. Um, so they were well received. We provided some grants to businesses and the, the types of grants we offered, there were three types. One was, if they weren't going to be um, open, what a great time to get some training done. So we went kind of dollar for dollar on some training support. The other one was some small businesses that need to capitally invest to just adjust quickly. So a coffee shop that didn't have an, a window opening to the to the street, um, or maybe buying some street furniture um, so that they could move a little bit more into in, on, into on street. And then the third type was, um, uh, believe it or not, a lot of small businesses aren't online. And so their, their ability to be agile enough, and we've seen the benefits of businesses that have been online and that some of them have really grown through this time. So providing grants to, pay, to businesses to, to lift their, their tech uh, profile and their online profile. Now they were so well received. We had just the business grants alone was about $5 million. Yesterday we announced um, with monies we've been given by state government a further $10 million, which will go towards um, uh, those business grants to businesses just in the city of Melbourne to assist them um, through the next few months as uh, as we as we begin our recovery exercise. I, I imagine it's interesting, isn't it? You know, you, you're dealing with an immediate crisis, but you've also got the responsibility to reimagine Melbourne, to understand that you know we, we will never be the same. So it's a two pronged approach, I imagine. And how do those things sort of converge? And how do you balance um, the focus on both those things? Look, um, and Kate, that's a really, really pertinent, really, really great question. So what we decided early was, one, we had to make sure that we were responding to the crisis, the immediate crisis, making sure that the city was as safe as it could possibly be. So we, we uh, one more quick example, we employed about 500 people you know, in a matter of weeks with Spotless and they went about cleaning the city and not just our city, city of Yarra, Maribyrnong, um, so we really went overboard in terms of making sure that we're responding, reacting, um, and making sure that our, our, our citizens were safe, um, our streets were safe, and there was a perception of safety. And this is all pre, pre-stage four. The second thing we did was stand back and go, okay, what does a city of the future look like? And I remember when I was at State Government, I had the opportunity to look closely at New York City's um, recovery in post-GFC period. And Bloomberg, then Mayor, um, really knew that his city was too reliant upon um, upon the, the financial services sector and he looked at diversification into biomed, biotech and other areas. Um, and so they invested strongly. And I think the opportunity at the city, within the city of Melbourne, is we've been reliant upon population growth for a long time. Um, and that's been underpinning you know, the economy, certainly of the state and, and equally the economy of the city of Melbourne. And so the, the, the time to stand back and reflect on that, to think about what a city of the future looks like, um, and to really, to be able to, you know, the word pivot maybe, but to think about um, medium to long term. And I know it's used a lot, but never let a, a crisis go to waste, but taking the opportunity to stand back and reflect. Uh, so we've drawn upon hundreds and hundreds of, of, of local, national and international thinkers to really uh, bring some thoughts forward about the city of the future. And in a few weeks time, there's a paper that council will consider, um, which really is a blueprint, not just about city recovery, but about the city of the future. So that, that's fascinating. And, and you talk about you know, uh, lessons from a city like New York. Um, around the world, where else are you kind of looking for the lessons out of this, whether or not it be you know, now or from the past? Yeah, look, that's, uh, we've, we've um, there's a group of cities that are signed up to 
um, to uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So pre-COVID, we'd made a decision that we were going to look towards those cities that had adopted and had been benchmarking and looked towards the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So we'd moved in this direction as a city. One is, what are the best cities in the world that we can learn things from? Now, in many instances, people look to Melbourne to learn from Melbourne. You know, we're not just uh, the, the most livable city. And when you look at the success of Melbourne over many, many, many years, decades, um, so many cities look towards Melbourne. In reverse, who do we look to and what do we look, um, look to them for? Who can we learn from, listen to, um, and what can, we, what can we adopt? And our thinking was also um, about making sure that uh, when we did that, we would, we would um, adopt something, make sure we were leading on it, but then thinking about how can we impart that to cities in developing, in developing countries, in particular in the Asia-Pacific region. So what we've done is accelerate that work and that thinking and that analysis. So we've looked in some cities, um, for example, European cities do um, waste recycling and, and closed loop recycling so much better than any city in Australia. Um, and we've got to get better at that. So when you look at Milan, uh, Milan are doing this and they are just years, decades ahead um, of where, of where uh, Melbourne and other cities are. So what is it that they're doing? How did they do it? What can we learn from it? And, um, and so, um, and look, there's many cities that we've looked at um, uh, at, at Cape and um, you'll see them come out in the City of the Futures paper as we bring that thinking, um, bring that thinking into the City of Melbourne. Great, thank you. And look, a reminder to our audience, you can submit quest questions uh, through Slido and you can also vote for those questions as well. So we get to, we'll get to your questions in a moment. Justin, you and I are both working from home and what a transformation sort of that has been across sectors. Will we ever see those office tower blocks uh, fill up again? You know, will, will, they, will be, they be used in the same way? What's the thinking around that? Mm. Look, and Kate, that's one of our biggest concerns. And so there's a slide I'm going to put up now, which uh, there's two slides. Um, and so I've got uh, someone from Office to ask if you can just put them up on screen for a second, please. Um, I hope people can see these. Uh, can you see that, Kate? Yep. Great. So look, this first slide, um, everyone, is um, a slide that looks at, we have 60 of these throughout the city, which are pedestrian monitors. Now, I know this is starting the obvious, but the blue line is what uh, was there last year. It's a seven day average movement and the red is what occurred, uh, what's occurred, uh, what's occurred this year. So you can see where it's just really literally fallen off a cliff and you can see where stage four is. Now, that's one, but every one of these replicates uh, this movement. That's slide one. Slide two. Um, this slide here, and I'm not sure if you can see the number right down the bottom, people, uh, can you see the number right yep. down the bottom there, Kate? Great. Yep. So, look, this is us looking at every, um, this is us looking at every uh, cohort and what might be an expectation. So, at the moment, and it's 2016 figures, so you've got to add about 10% um, to those figures. So that 911,000 is about a million people. Now, we've started to do some forecasting and some modelling with PricewaterhouseCoopers. We know that a lot of organisations have made decisions that they'll continue to work from home. Um, you know, big organisations that take up big office footprints in the city like Telstra. So we've got to look at what that means in terms of a future, a future city and a future population. And you can see the next one, students, metropolitan visitors, residents at 100%, visiting children, international visitors. And these are the figures for um, the remainder of, you know, after in a post-COVID environment and in that first um, in that first three to nine month, maybe three to 12 yeah. month mark. So one of the biggest risks we've got there is, uh, is foot traffic in the city because that then impacts on retail. And we know that retail has been dramatically impacted by what's happening online anyway and the acceleration of online we saw. Uh, we saw um, JB Hi-Fi's results and a few others just in the in the last uh, in the last few days. So the acceleration of online and then foot traffic means that the city is going to 
uh, really need to think about uh, think about attraction. So we at the City of Melbourne are lead with we are going to have 100% return of our workers as soon as possible into the city. We're going to have a strong presence. Um, and we think that whilst there are good ways that people can work agile, agile, in an agile manner and to be able to work from home, um, we also know that these, these um, employers, we want them to continue to have a presence within the city. So uh, the upside, the silver line, Kate, I reckon we're probably going to resolve traffic congestion and transport congestion pretty quickly. <laughs> yes. um, but the flip side is we've got to think of other ways that we're going to bring, bring, bring people back into the city and for workers, things like staggered work times. So it won't be everyone potentially starting at 8 a.m. We'll be thinking about people starting at 6, at 7, at 8, at 9. So different times of the day. Um, but we certainly are working with the major employers to make sure that there's a commitment to bring workers back into the city because they're such a, a critical part of our, of our DNA. So, Justin, you know, all of that requires absolute coordination across retail, across the corporate sector, the cultural sector, hospitality. How do you bring all of those voices together and get some coordination around that? Yes. Um, so, Kate, we've got a group that uh, we've got a group of about uh, 15 heads of, so the head of the Retailers Association, Paul Zara, the, the, um, the head of the Department of Jobs Precincts, um, Simon, Simon Fennis, uh, the person who's doing the economic recovery for the Treasurer. Um, we have the likes of the um, Crystal Wall from the Property Council. So we've got a group and uh, that group is, we've called it a leadership coordinating group. So lots of thing, great things are happening with people all inputting. A lot of our councillors have um, have groups that are inputting into them. I know our Lord Mayor's got a, a reference group that she's using. Um, and these people are initiating really, really, uh, you know, great, great initiatives, great ideas. So we're gathering those and making sure that we're using good evidence, we're thinking globally about what's the best initiatives and then coordinating them. Let me use, Kate, just one example. Um, the brand of Melbourne is being damaged interstate uh, by way of by way of tourism and visitors. So if I'm in Queensland right now and the borders reopen tomorrow, I'm not going to be in a rush to come back to Melbourne unless two things occur. One is it's got to be safe, mm. and two is the perception has got to be there that it's safe and it's ready and it's returned. So we're working behind the scenes to make sure that the city is 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 entirely safe. And then our wayward signage and all the things that will matter to make a safe city are uh, in place. And then we know that with Visit Victoria um, and with our own marketing and events arm at the City of Melbourne, with all of the other cultural institutes um, and events groups around Melbourne, we need to double, triple down our marketing and promotion efforts interstate to make sure that we're bringing back interstate visitors. Internationally, with well, the work research that's been done by Austrade. Um, and Tourism Australia, uh, Melbourne's brand has not been damaged. Australia and Melbourne is seen as an absolute safe haven compared to what's happening in other parts of the world. So we know that when we do turn the ball, when the borders do reopen, we're likely to see an influx of international visitors. Um, and again, um, safety um, and making sure that the experience when they return, they're not returning to Melbourne seeing lots of empty shops, they're returning to Melbourne to see a vibrant, active city. So the groups are set up in some subgroups, all coordinating to work on the most important initiatives and levers to pull. It's interesting, isn't it, the, 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 the different um, perceptions in relation to brands. So domestically, you know, damaged, but internationally, you know, not so much. It is about confidence building, isn't it? And does that start with local confidence building? It does. I think that if we've got people who are, you know, people who um, have been part of Melbourne's fabric um, and that group I showed before, workers, residents, you know, people who, international students who we would see um, on the front lawn of the State Library, back on the front lawn of the State Library, um, making sure that, you know, people that had, you know, the people that had activities within the city are returning, to, they're returning to the restaurants, they're returning to the theatres, they're returning to the sporting venues. Um, and I think when we see the domestic confidence from Melburnians, um, we're then going to see that that, um, you know, that will be communicated widely um, and certainly, uh, certainly intrastate. Um, you know, look, I, I really strongly believe perception is reality and we've got to work not just on it being safe, but the perception of safety. 
Um, and the best way to do that is to model that ourselves, which is why, Kate, we're bringing back our workforce in its entirety as soon as we can, our 2,000 employees back into, uh, into the town hall precinct um, you know, from, from the moment we can. Well, on that, transport will be a real challenge, won't it? And I, I, I know even when we came back um, uh, um, in between the two lockdown periods, um, it was certainly a real, it was on people's minds, you know, the, 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 the notion of coming back into the city and how you get back into the city is a real issue. Yes, it is. We're, we're, again, Department of Transport working really closely with, and they are thinking through, again, the number of trains, the frequency, the time, and the same as, uh, same as trams. What we do know is that, um, you know, we've got 70,000 um, 70, commercial car bays within the city, and for many people, and in particular, you know, for some cohorts, the ability to drive into the city in the early days is going to be important and that those coming in by public transport, that it's both timely and it's safe. So they're a critical part of the recovery plan. The, the other one, um, Kate, is we've seen an absolute spike in the number of people who are riding uh, bicycles. We've just, um, normally a bike lane in the, in the, on, a, on a Vic Roads road takes about two years to get approval. I've got to tell you in two weeks, uh, we had um, 40 kilometres nearly of laneways, bike, new bike laneways approved. And they've been installing them day and night, 24 hours a day. And so those of you that haven't been in the city for some time and you come back in, um, and I, I was walking, I was heading down, um, down Queens Road the other day and uh, William Street and just looking at what's occurred. It really is, uh, really is very exciting. Kate, all the small laneways, so Flinders Lane, Little Collins, Little Burke, uh, Little Lonsdale, all of those are going to be shared walkways. You're going to see larger uh, footprints um, on the footpaths with them shared both bike, pedestrian and for motor vehicles. But motor vehicles um, really uh, slowed down to walking space, walking pace. Um, and it will change, the, the, the shape of the city, city will really change in terms of being much more walkable um, and certainly a really good place to be able to ride, um, you know, not just, um, not just uh, north, south, but, um, uh, east west. Mm -hmm. Well, look, Justin, we might go to uh, questions now, and uh, a couple of questions just in relation to uh, how Melbourne bounces back, particularly in relation to sports, events, and, and the cultural capital. And I have to say, you know, it, it, it is jarring to see in Western Australia, you know, thousands of people going to sporting events. It feels like a long way away. What's the planning around that? Um, so, uh, one, yeah, go back to, one is to make sure that those places are safe. Just remember when the MCG reopens, um, you know, even, even with a half capacity, it's going to be bigger than those, uh, than those other, other grounds. So, look, I, I don't think it's far away. I think that, you know, if I listen to uh, Mark Pakula, the sports minister, um, and the conversations we're having with the, with the department, with Peter Betts, who heads up Sport and Recreation Victoria, I think that... Uh, you know, it will bounce back and they will open. And I think that we're going to see, you know, again, not just our sporting events, but our cultural um, institutions reopen. And the time that people have had to stop and think about resetting themselves has been really exciting. So what we're seeing is, I think that they're gonna open bigger and better. Um, and so the timing of them opening and the streets of Melbourne as we open, you know, as we approach the end of the year, leading into Christmas and New Year, um, there's some, I, I, I can't, uh, I can't steal our Lord Mayor's Thunder, but some really exciting um, activities planned for, for Melbourne reopening. Um, in fact, it's, it's going to one of our, our council forum meetings uh, next Tuesday in terms of, you know, we will double, triple down um, our investment in events and activities around the city. Um, and groups like the State Library, groups like the NGV, um, and, and sporting, you know, sporting events like the MCG, um, sporting venues like the MCG are just such a critical and central part of that because they are what makes Melbourne such a great city. The next question is an interesting one too, just um, uh, in relation to, we've talked a lot about uh, business and commercial, um, but what's the city doing to support and address the most vulnerable people who are often uh, the greatest affected? Look, I'm the, so proud of what the City of Melbourne staff have done here. Um, and so there is, uh, we, so we have, 
provide intensive support for um, for, for people who are, are more socially disadvantaged. And so if I'm older and uh, older and living alone somewhere in the city of Melbourne right now, um, then I'm going to be doing it much tougher, uh, much tougher than any other cohort. One is I'm far, for, far more fearful for my, for my health and wellbeing. Um, and so the efforts that have been made to make sure that we are constantly in communication um, with our with our community. You know, we've got you know, we've got 160,000 residents, and you know, there is strong connections in there with the various communities. When North Melbourne um, IRIs a state lockdown, um, the City of Melbourne really stepped in and uh, and worked closely with the community and the leadership groups that were there to make sure that they had access to information. Were given support. Um, we operated. 24/7, um, the the food distribution centre and delivering uh, medicines and all sorts of uh, all sorts of support uh, mechanisms to people in lockdown in the high rise estate. Um, we've got our on street um, homelessness team, and it's ironic, you know, if there again is a silver lining. Um, you know, we had 350 people sleeping rough on the streets of Melbourne, and last night there was maybe 10 to 15, and the 10 to 15 that are there. Um, have an option, but they've got serious mental health uh, and and uh, and drug and alcohol issues. Um, but you know we've got all those people that are in hotels, and those hotels people will move from those hotels um, into more permanent housing. And you know, ninety more well, more than ninety percent of the people that are there want to be housed and want to be accommodated. And it just shows you when there's a crisis that you know homelessness. I don't say it's been solved. But it's a long way to solving what was it? You know, it was a, it was it was a blight on Melbourne, um, and uh, and it's just so exciting to see what the what the opportunity holds itself for Melbourne without uh, hundreds of people sleeping rough and being on the streets. It's 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 really important, um, and so you know, the city had put in a lot of effort into uh, and and again had identified a number of its own buildings to move into crisis accommodation. Um, now. Uh, what we've seen with COVID is the state government step up and invest more than it has previously and it needed to. You know, there are 40,000 families on waiting lists in this state for public housing. So they've doubled, tripled, quadrupled down their investments in housing and a pathway um, called from homelessness to homes. Um, it's a great initiative. And just off the back of that, another question, what's the vision for affordable, low, no income and flexible housing, so co-housing, work studios, et cetera, and what, what are the thoughts around, uh, around how we move towards that? Mm. So the city's got an affordable housing strategy and every development that we undertake, we commit to a really strong percentage of affordable housing. And uh, we've identified that you've, we've got to make sure with Melbourne um, that there's not, and I describe it a bit like um, you know, walking across a bridge, that if there's a segment of that bridge missing, um, then it's not complete and you can't complete your journey. So if I'm a rough sleeper, I need to have a bed over my head, an emergency bed of an evening. Um, if I'm a, um, and, and I need a pathway there all the way through to, to private rental and, and potentially um, home, home ownership. Um, equally, we've got to make sure great cities don't have their workers um, traveling an hour and a half into work in the city. So affordable housing for key workers and people who work in the city who are on average incomes. If I'm a, if I'm a nurse, if I'm a doctor, if I'm working at the State Library, if I'm working at the City of Melbourne, um, we've got to make sure that we've got an array of housing um, that, that, that accommodates um, our, our, our workforce and our community. So we're seeing some really good developments up opposite the Queen Victoria market um, the Munro development um, is a is a build to rent. It's the first of its kind in the uh, first of its kind in Victoria, um, and is really exciting. We are prescribing where we're undertaking developments in the likes of you know the redevelopment of Arden Macaulay, um, and its master planning is all um, setting minimum standards for affordable housing. Uh, and again, affordable housing being different, as everyone knows, to public housing. Um, so making sure that there is a suite um, and, and a full array of, of, of housing options. Um, but affordable housing is, is really important. There is an undersupply in Melbourne. Um, and if anything, with COVID, what we're going to see is a bit of an oversupply of housing in the shorter term. And that in itself also presents some opportunities for, uh, 
that in itself presents itself Kate, for some opportunities for more affordable housing. I saw a figure the other day that I think in South Bank alone, rents have dropped 20% just in the previous uh, three months. Bit of a shift in focus uh, now, and perhaps a, a shift uh, back to the discussions about laneways, etc. Um, while the city is empty, um, what more can be done, and and what is being done? I, I I noticed Justin when I I went back to the city, in between our two lockdown periods, you know the amount of uh, of work that was going on, the building sites still uh, I, there was lots of activity. So tell us a bit about what's been happening um, over the past four months. Mm -hmm. So look, I, there is a really, really, really um, exciting announcement about laneways that I can't make because I'm not people <laughs> there, um, and it's ready. It's 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 nearly ready to go. Um, but use your imagination and think about Melbourne's great laneways, and think about you know, Hosier Lane and Effin uh, Lane. Think about them and think what might be possible. Um, and so uh, the the Arts Melbourne team have been working closely with Creative Victoria. And there's a really, really exciting proposal, Kate. That um, you know, it's 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 weeks away, um, and hopefully even um, even even sooner. So look, that's uh, that's one. And we're using um, so a lot of the really grotty laneways. So think through the ones that you know they've got rubbish and they they smell and go. You know, so there is a sprucing up of those. And then what will change them? And what change them is this, is if they're if people can move through them and they want to go through them. So, you know, if you think, think through those people who have been to Hosier Lane and how populated it is, um, you know, night and day. And so laneways are really special in Melbourne. And, and so on that one, watch, watch this space. The arts grants that we put out, nearly 2 million of those to small individual artists, um, you know, more than a thousand of those. And so we're seeing lots of live performances online and some really um, again, some exciting activity that on the other side of COVID we're going to see, um, we're going to see, um, you know, come to fruition. Um, the bike lanes that I mentioned, Kate, don't underestimate the influence they're going to have on those small laneways. Um, we made a decision every year we plant about 3,000 trees and shrubs in the city and we remove about 2,000 no? so for because of risk purposes or other reasons. Um, we went early and did it partly as an employment program and we partnered with state, but we're planting 150,000 trees and shrubs across the city um, and that several thousand of those are semi-mature trees coming into the city of Melbourne. So when you come in, you're going to see uh, more trees um, in this, not just inside the hodl grid, but if anyone goes up to Royal Park right now, it's a really exciting to look at. Um, 150,000 against a net 1,000 per annum. Um, so look, there, there are a couple of things that we've been doing that I think is starting to really change um, you know, the, the, the face of Melbourne. We're offering to all restaurants the opportunity to really spill out onto the streets. The European experience is you don't go inside a coffee house, you're kind of out in the street and really thinking about that on-street experience. Um, so fast tracking permits for restaurants to be able to spill with tables and chairs out onto footpaths. Um, and thinking about you know, closing off a couple of couple of parking bays to allow people to to access those. Um, so I think it's it's pretty exciting um, now how we are kind of reshaping the look and feel of the city. Kate, Justin, a, 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 a comment and a question from someone. A congratulations on the initiative around cleaning crews across the CBD. The CBD's never looked better, never looked cleaner. Will this continue? Uh, beyond COVID, asks one of our viewers. Yeah, look, I, there's something really in it. We 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 did this thing called um, it was called Project Zhuch, and it was done just before <laughs> Christmas. But we decided that I'd get every executive in Melbourne, including me. Um, we teamed everyone up, so I, I was teamed up with one of our one of our managers of our recreation yeah. centres. And we split the city into 40 different bits, 40 different parts, and essentially it covered you know, a, a couple of streets. And as executive, we decided that we would start our day and finish that day by going around and having a look. One, you know, if there was rubbish there, pick it up. B, um, really to have a closer look and look at it at different times of the day. And during the course of that December, we asked people to come in at least twice over weekends to look at them on a Saturday night or a Sunday. What we saw from that was um, there were parts of the city that needed to get more attention. And so we reset some of our thinking. So I, I think project, uh, the, the current cleaning 
um, has, has much been about the hygiene and prioritizing over poles and so forth, but the increased cleanliness you've seen, um, I'm, I'm committing to it's here to stay. We've really reset our way in which we've looked at the city. Um, Kate, we had a big, early on with COVID, you know, people did their spring cleaning and threw stuff out onto different parts of the streets in Melbourne. And we made a decision to have that picked up, you know, rubbish gathers rubbish. So, um, you know, within hours we were picking that that uh, up. So we had a four or 500% increase in dump rubbish um, and we increased our response rate by about a thousand percent to know that um, just to make sure again, the city, if it looks good, um, if it looks good, it feels good, it's, it's clean, it is good, um, then that's also going to help the city really, uh, really revitalise itself. I love the name, Project Shush. That's fantastic. Project Shush. Mm -hmm. um, the next question uh, is, how does the fact that uh, businesses get two votes and residents one for Melbourne City Council influence planning and development? Uh, look, it's probably... It's an interesting question, um, and it's been there for, for some time, and I know it's been hotly debated um, between residents and, and, and businesses. Um, look, I'd say that there's a, a lower participation rate by businesses in terms of the voting. I don't think it influences planning, Kate, uh, in terms of, as a capital city, we've got to be thinking about, you know, we are the, we are the heart of the state's economy. Um, you know, some figures I saw yesterday concern me, that is that more than 50% of gross state product impact um, and downturn and impact over the next five years is going to be felt in the city of Melbourne. Mm. Um, so we've got to we've got to make sure that we are thinking about residents, but we can't be thinking about residents and not thinking about businesses. And so it's about making sure that there is um, that there's equal access to opinion and views. Um, but we are we are um, the heart of the city and, and probably the country's economy. We're the fastest growing economy of any state leading up to uh, the start of COVID. Um, you know, the, the balance of votes and questions is probably one one for state government in terms of setting up the um, the electoral voting system. But I, I certainly think the imperative for me and for the city of Melbourne is to make sure that all voices are heard. Um, when councillors go in there to vote, um, you know, they don't go in there with a mind of it's two votes and one vote. They go in there representing, um, you know, residents, businesses, visitors, um, all people um, who are part of the, the City of Melbourne million people a day community. Just a very uh, small question, this one, Justin. Um, how do you see Melbourne in 2025 compared to today in size, makeup and activity? <laughs> Yeah, look, I think we're going to recover entirely. I think it will take several years, but I think we'll recover and we'll be better for it. I, I think the biggest challenge that we're going to have in the immediate is that that foot traffic impact and the impact that we're seeing shopping online is going to mostly impact on the retail sector and I'm, I'm, I worry about that. That is something that keeps me awake at night because if you have, and people will remember strip shops when they went through the downturn back in the late 80s and early 90s, um, it, it wasn't good. You know, empty shops create more empty shops and it's almost cancerous. So um, I think about this a lot. And then I, I reflected back years ago, I read a book by Richard Florida on creative cities. And I think we've got to, and I don't know what it is yet, and I'm putting this out there and I'm saying it today, Kate, because I think people um, as part of your, uh, your network and your community uh, attached to the State Library are going to have some good ideas and initiatives. But I think part of the recovery, it's got to be talking to, to banks and APRA and we, we, you know, and we need to be talking to state government about what it might look like. But I think part of the regeneration and what happens within those spaces is going to be creative. Um, and I don't know what, but it will be a creative lens uh, and now whether or not they're shared workspaces or their makers markets or what they might be, I don't know. Uh, but I do think there's a real opportunity there. I think, I think we will in 2025, because we've stopped and reflected and the city was just growing at such a rate, the opportunity to reflect and make some of those really significant changes. 40 kilometres of bike lanes and changing the way in which the Hoddle Grid operates to make it. We were struggling. We, we took on Telstra because they were putting those big telephone boxes over footpaths and saying, you know, you, you can't do it because you're blocking pedestrian traffic. We were seeing at peak hours, 
people spilling over and from Swanson Street as they were trying to get to Flinders Street Station. And it was it was getting dangerous. And so being able to set back and reset that, knowing that we need to be great cities throughout the world, the one thing I do know are walkable cities. Um, you've got to be able to move across them safely, easily, um, and that part of it is a whole experience. So the green canopy that needs to exist in the city, um, you know, the, the culture, you know, people mentioned uh, the question about laneways before, but ducking down a laneway because it's pretty cool. And, you know, and I think the that opportunity, I think, is going to set, you know, that, that you know, never waste a good crisis or well, using the crisis to really think about the future of Melbourne um, and its people is, is, has been really important. And I think we'll see the fruits of that in five years. Um, by 2025, Kate, I think those in five years will go, wow, we made the best of the worst um, yeah. to, to get Melbourne in a better space. Yeah, no, really great point. Look, probably our final question, uh, it's all we have time for, is a, is a great one. In the context of all of that, will we also be implementing social, uh, socially distanced festivals and events and similar to the ones that were introduced uh, in the UK a couple of weeks ago? Yes, we will. Um, yes, we will. And I think that is the real opportunity here is to rethink, you know, what, what those festival events are. And even, you know, we're rethinking um, as we speak. And again, it's to be considered by council, it's for a meeting on Tuesday. But, um, you know, what does New Year's Eve look like in Melbourne um, coming up? And again, some really, really clever uh, thinking being put into how do you celebrate the end of the year and how do you celebrate in a way that's going to be, um, you know, special and unique to Melbourne. So I think there's a real opportunity here and um, all, all, all ideas anyone has, I just think I keep saying that people funnel them in, feed them in because, um, you know, some of, the, some of the best ideas I've heard of aren't coming from the likes of, you know, me or bureaucrats. They're coming from people in the community who are saying, what, what about, what about we do next? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Laneways Initiative came from, came from a, a young person. Um, and from that, again, you'll see the announcement in a week or two, but gee, you'll, you'll be excited by it. Fantastic. I hope you will. Well, hope you will. One thing, <laughs> one thing um, we haven't spoken about, and a couple of people have mentioned in the questions, is the international student cohort, a big cohort for the State Library and so mm. many living in, uh, in uh, this city. Tell us a little bit about yeah. not only how you've responded um, in the past few months, but also about any strategies you have moving forward to bring to ensure that we, you know, retain and continue to grow that cohort. Mm. Look, there's such you know, Melbourne is a university city, and as being part of a university city, we've really benefited from being a, a multicultural university city because of the, you know, the diversity of our of our students that are living and studying here. Um, and it's devastating to see what's happened. So look, quickly in terms of some things we did, we heard early that a number of students who were here that were working two or three jobs were really doing it hard. And so we thought, well, we'll provide some, we'll, we'll you do these $200 vouchers in $5 denominations that you can use in the Queen Victoria market, thinking we might get you know, a couple of hundred applications. We got 17,000 applications within 48 hours which just showed how tough that cohort was doing. Now, you know, we moved through those grants uh, really uh, quickly and were able to put them in the hands of the students um, distributing through the, the town hall. Socially, we've been connecting. There's a Friday night lounge uh, that they can access using Zoom. And again, there's um, thousands of those students participating in that. Um, we have an idea that we've been pressing uh, with the Commonwealth. And for those of you who remember the Columbo plan, um, that I reckon there is an opportunity and we're, we're pushing for this to be a conversation at the Commonwealth level. Uh, but imagine if you were given the opportunity to study in Melbourne and it was aligned to citizenship so that your pathway is not only you study here, you have the option of dual citizenship. So yes, you might return, um, but you know, we invest so much. And, and so if you think through just a straight productivity lens, plus the investment we make um, over four, five, six, seven years, depending on the time that the, the student studies here, about being part of Melbourne, about being part of Australia. So the opportunity to have dual citizens, so if they're returning, that um, they can be part of, uh, of, of our city. And the saddest thing I see is when a student finishes, um, and I know when I was responsible for international students at state government, um, it was more than 70% of students that studied here wanted to continue to live here. 
and the number who couldn't continue to live here and would return home was 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 really really disappointing. So I think there's a real opportunity there to bring the two conversations um, two conversations together. Um, and look, and the other one is I, I do think we'll be remembered by our international students for the, uh, I'll use the term pastoral care, Kate. We've provided really extensive pastoral care to the students to make sure that they know that they're, you know, they're, they're, it's not a commercial transaction, that they're part of our community and they're a really important part of our community. Look, that's all we have time for. Thank you, Justin Haney, uh, CEO of City of Melbourne. Thank you so much for your time and for all the work that you're doing to sort of reimagine Melbourne on the other side of this. And thank you to the audience for joining us and for your thoughtful questions today. And that's the final uh, conversation in six weeks, six issues. But there are more State Library conversations being announced soon and plenty for you, you to explore online and on social through Library in Your Lounge. So in the meantime, Stay safe and well.